you can't just quit. You have, you're gonna have injuries, you're gonna have setbacks, you're gonna have issues, you're fatigued, you're not, you, you still gotta keep going and just do what you can train, train around the issue. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today is the creator of one of the most famous glute workout moves popularized on social media, the hip thrust. With 55 peer-reviewed studies to his name, he's not just an academic, he's a practitioner who continues to put his ideas into practice with a long list of clients that he trains and coaches seven days a week. He is considered by many to be the world's foremost expert on glute training and has turbocharged the fitness industry by introducing effective new exercises and training methods for optimal glute development. In our interview, we discuss the mind-muscle connection and when it's likely to work and not work, how and when to use a training to failure method, and why you need to be using the rule of thirds when training your glutes. So if you're interested in the latest research on strength training, muscle building, and why it's not just women that need to start training glutes, then I think you'll enjoy this week's interview with the godfather of glutes, Mr. Brett Contreras. Brett, thank you for inviting me over, Las Vegas. Yes, you're very welcome, thanks for coming. How do you feel about being, what's it, you know, Las Vegas, San Diego, you know, do you, you, you all the time on the strip, hitting the casinos, or are you staying out of it? It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny, the people who live in Las Vegas laugh at the, you know, we never go to the strip. Um, I, I do, when I have people visiting, I'll take them to, you know, like STK for dinner or something, We'll go to Cosmo or something. It's very rarely. Like, I live in North Vegas. It's peaceful. It's so quiet. I love it. Um, and it's a whole different, you know, it's very different than what I thought Vegas would be like. It's a, it's a, it's a nice place. I like, I like your, uh, your little setup that you've got here. Well, this is my garage gym. Um, you know, I think it's 1,000 or 1,200 square feet. But it's nice, but I would like to have a facility. It's just hard to find one here. I actually just put down an offer, um, but there's two other, two other people uh, bidding for it, so who knows? And I don't like five-year leases. I like three-year leases because gym owners are kind of screwed in that regard. I remember when the, uh, in 2007 when the housing market collapsed. <clears throat> you know, what are, you're a gym owner, but you're on the hook to keep paying. That was my first kind of scare. And then we had the, the pandemic, well, in Vegas, it wasn't a big deal, but in California, I think I was forced to pay, you know, I paid full rent for about a year when we weren't allowed to have, have uh, you know, clients. We weren't al allowed to be open, but I was still, I was still paying full rent. So, uh, you know, for personal trainers to have brick and mortar business, we're, we're non-essential, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not a good thing to have to sign a five-year lease if you don't have to. So I always do three-year leases and it's hard because everyone wants five now. For people who don't know you, like you, I, I believe it is 50 review, peer-reviewed papers. Like what, what out of, you know, a lot of work, what would you say out of that is it, are the sort of areas that you're most proud of achieving that I suppose um, for anyone that's listening to, to give a sense of, you know, some of your accomplishments and what you do outside of just being a very successful social media influencer? Well, those papers, um, <clears throat> all right, those 50 published scientific studies, many of them were done with my friend Brad Schoenfeld. Brad and I became best buds a while back, and it was so cool because <clears throat> my stuff on biomechanics and his stuff on hypertrophy, he was more physiology, I was more biomechanics, but they went hand in hand. Like, I was already thinking about all this stuff. I'm going, when I do a hip thrust, I feel the most tension in my glutes at the very top, at the lockout. But when I do a lunge, I feel a deep stretch in my glutes. You know, I feel during the lowering phase, I feel it stretching and creating muscle damage. And then when I do high rep hip thrust, high rep bands, I get this crazy pump and burn. You know, sometimes I have to, oh, it's burning so bad. And I'm not just thinking about with glutes, I'm thinking about all the muscles. And then I'm going, he has his three primary mechanisms of muscle growth. The most important is mechanical tension. Then you got metabolic stress and muscle damage. Well, I'm going, the exercises you perform and how you perform them impact how much tension, muscle damage, metabolic stress you're gonna achieve. So we got along like this, you know, right away. Now, at the time, there was this anti-bodybuilding sentiment. It was kind of funny, like people were, 
bashing bodybuilders. It's like the pendulum went this way. It was all about bodybuilders and Arnold and all these, and then it went way to the other way to where it was absurd. People were going, the pump does nothing. You, you know, high reps do nothing. Really? It got so out of control. Machines are worthless. And I'm like, I don't think this isn't true. I love free weights, but I love machines. Any good, you know, my idol was Mel Siff. He wrote Super Training. He's, he's, he deceased, but he had a heart issue. But he was a true scientist. He loved everything. And that's what I strive to be. I, I like studying, uh, you know, strength, strength training for athletes, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, strongman powerlifting, CrossFit, how to train the different sport athletes in the Olympics, um, physical therapy. It all blends together. It's all science. How to train for maximum flexibility, how, you know, cardio, all the different things matter. It all ties into strength and conditioning. And so I wish more people were like that. And so we, we approached things in that manner. We said, we, we want to, and also we were wrong about a lot of things. I remember when Brad and I first started talking, we we're like, you, you hear about this Stu Phillips guy? Yeah, he's saying that lightweights builds muscle just as much as heavyweights. Well, yeah, and beginners, but you know, when you get advanced, you got to lift heavy weights. No, we were wrong. <laughs> and I remember we were talking about it. We respect Stu, but I just can't buy it. Well, we did our own study, and we found out Stu was right. <laughs> so we changed our minds. But we helped change, move that pendulum back to where it belongs in the center. Not here, not here. It belongs here. And we did that through publishing journal articles, but also writing articles for T Nation. We had a little podcast for a while, things like that. But we worked hard to get the pendulum back to where it should be. And then I started publishing articles about hip thrusts, the very first published articles on hip thrusts and glutes. And I got the scientific community interested in hip thrusts. Now there's like, I would guess, probably 50 studies on hip thrusts that have been published. So. It was cool getting my first paper published um, with Brad. It was actually on crunches. Really? <laughs> yeah. And whether or not they're dangerous. And we came to a conclusion that they're not that dangerous. And the people that are saying crunches damage your spine, we don't have that evidence. What about the drawing like with reps and weight then? Did you, did you sort of differentiate between those two things at all? No, because... All the studies used to say crunches aren't good okay. were done in a, this jig that compresses. You get an, you know, a, basically a, a vertebrae, disc, vertebrae, right? And then you compress it. Because when you, when you exercise, the muscles pull together and clamp down. The muscles in between the rib cage and the pelvis, when they contract, they compress. So you put, you know, a couple thousand newtons of compression on it, and then you move it, you move that, uh, that uh, you know, segment through a range of motion, full flexion, full extension, and you do that about 10,000 cycles, you're likely to get a disc herniation. And you wouldn't use a human uh, lumbar spine, you would use a pig cervical spine because the pig cervical spine is very similar to a human lumbar spine. But there are some issues with that. Number one, it's dead. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dead specimen. It's not living. It doesn't heal. Number two, we don't just do 10,000 straight crunches. We do a little bit, then we rest, and then a couple days later you do it again. And you also don't go to end range every time. When you do a crunch, you're not crunching as far as you can possibly go. So we concluded that this is, there's no evidence of, there's not good evidence to support this, and we need better evidence, and that, that better evidence never emerged. <laughs> and since then, people have chilled out about that. Remember the pendulum? It was all about abs. Then the crunch became the, 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 the devil. It was the scapegoat. We always need some exercise out there that's killing people. That's a de we need to demonize some exercise. For many years, it was the crunch. And the, people, the, the youngsters listening to this will be like, what? They won't even know. But yeah, for a while, if you did crunches or perform, prescribed crunches, you were the worst trainer. You were dangerous. You didn't care about your, your client's spines. And now, 
you know, it went way this way, and then now it's back in the center. And then finally, so I, that was my first published article. And a funny story about that is Brad sent it to me. He, he did the intro. And then he said to me, he said, okay, work on this. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. So I spent a whole month, and Brad, I think Brad thought I was slacking off. He kept going, hey, you, 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 did you finish that? And, no, I need another week. Hey, hey. Finally, I sent it to him, and he calls me up. He's like, Brad, what the hell? He's like, we have a word limit, and we can't reference. You have over 400 studies here. And it's like, I don't 70 pages. We, ours has to be about 15 pages max. There's a word count, and we can only reference about 100, 100 studies around. He's like, but I'm not mad at you. Where did you find this stuff? I spent like one or two months of my life, I can't remember what it was. It was, it was. I think it was like two months of my life reading. I read about 400 journal articles on disc physiology and disc biomechanics. And this was, you know, this was like 10 years ago. But at that time, I was one of the world's experts on <laughs> disc physiology. And I learned there's a lot about the physiology of these discs that can cause them to repair. Well, at that time, the leading expert was like, no, discs don't repair. They do not repair. They don't get good, good blood supply. They don't get good nutrient delivery. And, you know, he, he said, you have a limited number of flexion cycles. You should use those up to tie your shoes, not to do crunches. And it turns out that's not the case. Now there's some evidence that the discs do strengthen and they can heal. And, you know, he would say that, and I'm going, I've seen all this research showing, you know, you type in to Google, PubMed, spontaneously, spontaneous healing of intervertebral disc herniation. And you will find all these case studies where, you know, someone had a herniated disc, and a few months later they went in to image these people, and there was no more disc herniation. You know, maybe at a microscopic level there was some, because soft tissue doesn't tend to heal back superiorly, it tends to heal back inferiorly, whereas bone heals back stronger. But uh, regardless, discs do heal, Spines are very strong and resilient, and we need people to know that and believe it. We shouldn't make you know fear monger them and say, "Don't ever bend over. You're using up every time you bend over. That's one more tick, and you've got you know you've got a one million cycles, and on the millionth one, you're done." It doesn't work that way. We can we can strengthen discs if we're intelligent about it, and I, I still think this is very hard to prescribe anything because there's a huge genetic component to it. There's also lifestyle components to it, you know, if you smoke and how much you sleep, all this stuff. And then, you know, how you, the exercise and then how you perform them. But that was my first study. <laughs> Brad helped me, Brad Schoenfeld, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we were very proud of that paper. And at the time, we were like, people, oh my God, these coaches were so dramatic. They accused us of being contrarians and we couldn't possibly believe this, and we're going, how can you possibly believe that crunches are dangerous? You see people in the gym. You're like, hey, bodybuilder, and he's like, I've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah, my back's fine. And these people are so stupid, they don't acknowledge that, and they think, and I'm just going, okay, you think I'm clueless, I think you're clueless, but now people have moved on. Now there's new scapegoats, like frog pumps. But anyway, um, that, that was my first study, and then I was so proud of my first original research. That's where it's like I conducted a training study, you know, where people actually did a, you know, a longitudinal study where people did a training program and we looked the effects of like, you know, 12 weeks of this on this. That's really cool too because that's like you're injecting original research into the literature. That's a, such a cool feeling. But yeah. Um, what was that for? That was on, on, on hip thrust versus front squats. Oh, okay. It was the, the force vector theory. So my theory was that people doing the front squats would transfer better to jumping, vertical jumping, whereas people doing the hip thrusts would be better at ex, you know, acceleration gains. And, um, and that turned out to be the case. Um, that's in, in, in support of the force vector hypothesis. So if you look at this force vector hypothesis, there's some conflicting research about free weights but I think the devil is in the details and how it was performed and the, mm -hmm. and the, the, the program design elements. But there's definitely support in plyometric research. You know, you should be doing, if you want to be the best athlete possible, don't just do vertical plyos, do horizontal, lateral, do some rotational stuff. You want to get strong and powerful in every vector. Up, forward, backwards, side to side, 
rotational. So that's, a, that's cool because I, I kind of revamped that theory. I wasn't the first one to ever think about it. I think I was the first person to put a model on it and call it the force vector hypothesis. And now there's a lot of evidence to support it. One of, the, one of the things I wanted to talk about was some of the things I've read that you've discussed in terms of strength and um, hypertrophy. And I, it was an interesting video I was watching last night actually about the mind-muscle connection and in terms of internal and external influence. And it, it's, it's not something, you, you seem to break things down into a level that most, I suppose most people don't think about, but just talk about that. It's, it's something that um, we've talked to people on the podcast about this mus mind-muscle connection, but explain what you believe about that and, and, and just talk a little bit about this sort of internal and external uh, influence, if that's the right, right word. All right, in a nutshell, if you're about to do a task, all right, if this task involves performance, meaning you need to jump as far as you can, or you need to lift the most weight possible, or you need to, you know, throw the hardest punch, or you need to throw a dart as accurate, or putt as accurately as possible. You would never think of the muscles. There's this constrained action hypothesis that was developed by Dr. Gabriel Wolf, and she basically said that when you focus externally on the environment, Think about putting. You think of, you watch the hole and you think of like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive the, I'm gonna drive through the, I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know what cues <laughs> golfers use. You, I, what I do not know is what cues they use, but I, I'm pretty sure they would think of the environment. Mm -hmm. They think of the, the club head or the, the, the hole, you know, they, if you're throwing a dart, you'd think of the, you know, don't look at the big thing, just focus on that little bullseye, something like that. I'm, I'm out and of if my... If you're punching, you would, and you wanted to hit a hard punch, you'd be focusing on what you're punching as opposed yeah, punch to... Yeah, punch through the... But you would not ever focus on your muscles. Right. You wouldn't be like, okay, you're about to putt. I want you to grip the, grip this club just the right amount. I want you to focus on, I don't even know what muscles are involved in a putt. <laughs> I want you to, you know, bleak, so I don't even think. It's just like a shifting side to side. But you, won't, you don't want to draw attention to your muscles because your body knows what to do. It, it will activate the precise motor units in the price amounts at the precise timing. It synchronizes everything together to carry out that action in the most efficient way possible to maximize performance. But okay? you have to, and I'm just on that, but providing that you're laser focused on sort of the task in hand and what you're going at. Is Something that... outside the body. Right. And, and I guarantee does it, does there's it more break to it. This down? is not my, one thing you know when you're a PhD, one thing you should know, because there's this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect where basically everyone thinks they're smarter than they are about things. And the dumber you are, the smarter, the more you overestimate your own intelligence and the more you underestimate the true expert's intelligence. And you see that all over social media these days, right? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Johnny <laughs> the blogger. Johnny the blogger knows more than the top scientist on this topic, and he and there's no convincing him otherwise. That's the Dunning Kruger effect, and scientists are supposed to be better at that. But I found that even a, a medical doctors seem to be the worst. They think since I'm a doctor, I'm a medical doctor, I'm an expert on anything. Well, they're clueless. The vast majority are so clueless about strength training and exercise, it's deplorable. They give the worst advice. Quit lifting. Do not lift weights for the next few months. You're telling me oh, you can't... And it's so sad that we can't set the bar higher and expect these doctors to learn the slightest fucking thing. Am I allowed to cuss? <laughs> no cussing. You've done the, it, sli yes. <laughs> the slightest effing thing about resistance training. Because most of the time these people could do light curls. If it's about their heart rate, say, wear a monitor and don't get your heart rate. Do one arm at a time to minimize the amount of muscle that you use. You can do some stuff. Put on a glute loop and you can do band abduction, band kickbacks, keep your glutes activated. Because we don't want people to stop. You know, we don't want them in bed rest. We don't want them just sitting, doing nothing. We want them resistance training. And if you can't do, you know, my whole life I've lifted weights. No matter what's been going on. <laughs> I try to do what I can. And I've been lifting weights for 30 years. And you, you can't just quit. You have, you're going to have injuries. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have issues. 
you're fatigued, you're not, you, you still got to keep going and just do what you can train, train around the issue. But anyway, back to, back to what we were talking about. I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And for a lot of these things, I'm the world's expert on glutes. Very confident about that. No one has put in the research, no one goes the lengths that I go to. However, I'm not the expert on uh, internal versus extra, on cueing for, for, for performance. So I would need to spend a month of my life really reading all those papers and then contacting those professors and asking them questions. In a month, I could be really smart at it. Um, <laughs> these people have spent their whole careers on it, you know? But what I will say is basically, there's probably more to it than just internal versus external. I'm, I'm sure. When would you use internal? So I'm you sure said you'd use like things like things that maximize performance, motivational stuff. You know, like maybe for one person, it's hey, pretend your family's captured and you're going to get them back if you achieve this. Or financial, hey, if you get this, pretend you're going to win a million dollars. Or actually, hey, here's a hundred bucks if you hit this lift. Um, so that would be an example of internal. No, that's different. Uh, okay, internal that's one. That's a, yeah, I don't even one. know what okay. a category it's right. called. It's so external is is like the putter focusing the on the environment, thing. right? And then internal, the something the, outside the body. Internal is focusing on something within the body. So, in the case of like, so I always say this: if you're trying to maximize muscular development then you should some of the time focus on the muscle at hand. Yes, it's going to overactivate that muscle. If you wanted to lift for the most reps, don't focus on that muscle, but you won't have quite as high of muscle activation and muscle force during that. So you should, especially towards the end of the workout, do some things where you're squeezing, focusing on that muscle. And Brad, Brad conducted a study, I was on that paper, we provided the first evidence in support of the mind-muscle connection. Back then, all the naysayers were saying, no, external is always better in every case. There was one outspoken coach that was like, strength coach, and he was like, I, 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 I rarely ever make bold claims, but I can honestly say in every scenario, external is better than internal. I'm going, think about all the cues that, like Louis Simmons and Dave, to these guys that were popular powerlifters would use to teach form. Chest up, knees out, you know, <laughs> these are internal cues, you know. And so uh, uh, there's no way, no reason to throw those out. And so, so when I you're doing say, glutes, then are you getting. Yeah, the, squeeze the glutes, you know, feel the glutes, squeeze the glutes at the top of a hip thrust. That's fine to say. Not always, not if they're, not if they're trying to do a one rep max, you don't want to be like, squeeze your glutes. <laughs> you would be like, picture driving that bar through the roof or something. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, we provided the first evidence in support of the mind-muscle connection, not with the quads, but with the biceps. The biceps grew larger from focusing on the muscle. And is that, a, is that a fact then based on your research? And if you're purely looking to build your biceps, then can, that mind-muscle connection on the bicep and squeezing and focusing on it, that has a benefit than just putting a lot of weight through, would you? Based on that study, but ideally in any situation... You wouldn't just go off one study you'd want, but that's the only study on the matter. So we don't have like definitive, this is nail in the coffin because there could be other scenarios, but I don't say all the time do that, some of the time. So I like the, the first uh, exercise of the workout, go heavier, don't just focus on the muscle, focus on your mechanics, focus on the environment, focus on setting performance goals. Then you can switch to more towards the mind-muscle connection, especially towards the end of the workout. But I could be wrong about that too. So we it's don't, just a we part, don't know you enough. build it into more like of a sort of a portfolio of different techniques, and that would be one of them. That based on what you know at the moment, exactly. You're fairly confident. And, and and over time, you tend to like when 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 athletes or bodybuilders or so, you know the best the creme de la creme tend to do things a certain way. Over time, you tend to find evidence to support why they did things that way. Mm. Um, and then also in the case of fixing form, and I, I say fixing form, some of the pain physios would get mad at me because they'd say there is no bad form, but uh, it's just different ways of doing things and some, some types of form more appropriate than others based on the goal, but like 
knee valgus. Knee valgus I don't think is as dangerous as people think, but your knee's caving in. If you wanted your knees not to cave in, you say knees out. But you tell them this is what knees out means, because a lot of times you go knees out and they'll take a wider stance. You say knees out at the bottom, meaning when you go to the bottom, I want you spreading your legs, and you want, you want them thinking about their knees. I've heard coaches try and come up with a, like, like an external cue for that. And I'm like, that's silly. Just mm. use an internal cue, it's fine. Quit being so dramatic, it's fine. So yeah, that's basically the gist of, the, of the, based on what we know now, my mind could change down the road as more <laughs> research emerges. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. The other one that I was interested in was, was the, I believe it's called the Henneman size principle. Um, it's something, again, that, that people have had talk, talk about it. You know, what, what's your view on that? Is that something you, you've spent any much time sort of figuring out? And, and where do you stand on that? So Henneman's size principle, you know, it's a, an orderly recruitment of the smallest motor units to the largest, depending on the task at hand. So if I'm lifting you know, above 90% of one rep max, right away I'm activating all the motor units. The smaller threshold, the larger threshold, you know, the high threshold, whatever. But if I'm going lighter, say I'm doing lightweight. Say I do bench press 225 for a set of 20. Well, the first few reps are easy. I'm, I'm recruiting more of the low threshold ones. Now as the set goes on, I start recording higher and higher, but then towards the end of the set, I'm, I'm so fatigued, you know, the metabolites and all these things are inter interfering with my muscle force production, so I've got to call in more and more motor units to complete the task, such that at the very end, it's a slow, grindy rep. I end up, throughout that set, activating all the motor units, and that's why you get similar hypertrophy between lighter and heavier conditions. So based on that research, people said it's always best to train to failure because only on that last rep where you're grinding the weight out do you really stimulate all the motor units and you really get maximum stimulus for adapting. And if you're just doing one set, you know, to failure, maybe that's the case. But when you do multiple sets, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there to support that going to failure is is not necessary and in some cases counterproductive. So you don't need to always go to failure. Sometimes leaving a rep or two in the tank leads to better results. So you, we got Henneman's size principle, but then we have this theory, but if the experiments don't completely match the theory, then the theory's wrong. Maybe it's the case that if you do four sets, you can get so fatigued on that first set that then your next few sets suck, or, so it's better to just leave a couple reps in the tank so that you can have four high quality sets or something like that, or maybe there's a different explanation. But that has implications for all these advanced techniques, which I'm a fan of all of them, and I think you need to learn when to use them. You know, on my last set of curls, I don't just keep them strict and then be done. On my last two reps, I'm going, and I heave it up, but then I do a controlled lowering, you know, and I feel like those last, that last rep I feel my biceps. I feel like that was the most quality that last, but I did a cheat rep. Right. So cheat reps, drop sets, you know, all these different, there's so many advanced techniques, you know, uh, f f forced reps, partials, all these different techniques. They all have implications, you know, heavy negatives, things like that, um, accentuated eccentrics, enhanced eccentrics. They're all different types. We use 20 of them here <laughs> in glute lab, but if failure training isn't optimal, then why would going way, way past failure be optimal? For example, if you do a set of shrugs or lateral raises, and the research shows that you don't have to completely go to failure, 
then why would going to complete failure, you know, I grab, I grab the, the hundreds for dumbbell shrugs and I do 30 reps, then I immediately go to the 90s and I do 10, then I go to the 80s and do eight, and then I go all the way down to the tens and I have tens and I'm gonna, uh, that's probably overkill, you know, and it can, it can, it can lead to overreaching. Mm. But you can spin your wheels with it. So and you got to so you got to be you got to be smart about the advanced techniques that you yeah, use. Yeah, because because also I was I was watching you talk about that in that when you are doing those advanced techniques or even going to kind of failure that depending on the type of muscle group and the exercise that you're training, um, failure is different. Like you, I think you was giving an example of these sort of side laterals with the bands and deadlifts and saying like you know if someone came with a gun to your head and you did your max on a deadlift they're going to shoot you. Whereas if someone said, right, you know, give me 10 more side laterals, you could just keep doing them. Um, so there's less. different, yeah, there's different types of failure. So I've talked about this a lot. There's different types of failure. For example, if I, my, my, the most I've ever deadlifted is 650. When I did that rep, if someone came up with a gun and said, I'm going to shoot you if you don't get one more, I can't get another. I'm dead. There's no matter how bad I want it, I can't get a second rep. I hate when people go, it's all about mind over matter. It's all about, my, okay, then go deadlift 3,000 pounds. Go set, the, <laughs> go set the world record then if it's all about mind over matter. There's physics to this, you know. There's muscles that attach to bones and create torque, and there's only so much that can be done here. And it, you hear people be like, no, if, if you have this adrenaline surge, average people can, you know, if a woman has her baby trapped, she can leg press a car and launch it, you know, flip a car over. Okay, then where are videos of this? Where's the evidence? There's only, if that were true, you could just, you know, take a shot of adrenaline right before a lift and then crush it. And if that were true, you would see that our voluntary activation would be very low. Like, you can, you can do an exercise, say a, a curl, and then you can shock the muscle while you do that curl, and then you subtract out, you look at the number of motor units recruited versus the maximal during being shocked, and then you see what percentage you're using. And most people, you know, beginners are at like, say, say, say 90%, but advanced lifters will be at like 98%. So you're only leaving a couple percent untapped. There's only so much extra room possible you know, so I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Where are the videos of these things happening? We've had cameras up for a long time. Anyway, um, so I think... Uh, so failure is a complicated thing. Failure is really complicated. Define. So w there's this, it's called the central governor model. With a lot of cardiovascular things and high rep things, it's your mind telling you, you know, you know I remember this guy telling this story about how he's running this marathon and he's like, I have the worst blister and he can just feel it and he just kept running. He's like, I have to stop, I have to stop. And he kept going for miles, but eventually he's just like, I can't do it anymore. This blister is ruining my, my race. I'm gonna, it's gonna be so bad. So he went and sat down, took his shoe off. There was no blister there. It was his mind playing tricks on him. How powerful is that, you know? And so that's called the central governor model. It's not really your muscles failing, it's your brain, it's, it's uncomfortable. That can probably be trained, obviously, to get a better, you know, pain tolerance or something, or, or uh, but uh, mental toughness, whatever. But with high rep stuff, yeah, you're doing lateral band walks, and you're like, oh my god, it's burning so bad. Rarely do you really go so bad to where you're like on the floor, crumbled over. Like, you know, some of my clients go that hard, but usually you're like, you stop your set. But if yeah, same scenario, someone had a gun, you could have done ten more. <laughs> If someone said, do 10 more, you'd be like, okay, I'm burning so bad, but then you'd get 10 more. So you're not really going to failure with those. But there's other types of failure too, but yeah, it's a complicated topic and it's more nuanced than people say. So when people say, should I go to failure or should I not go to failure? Yes, you should go to failure some of the time and not other time. It's a nuanced topic. I hate when people answer it with a yes or no answer. It's nuanced. You, yeah. you, you got to describe how and when and there's a lot of gray area in that. And one of the things, uh, we've interviewed quite a few bodybuilders, and I interviewed Dorian Yates as an example. So he was really the, the sort of go-to-failure, maximum amount uh -huh. of weight. I interviewed Frank Zane that's very different. He's about you know, keeping 
yourself safe, not, not being injured. So in terms of sort of exercises and adaption so that you are, when you get to your 40s, 50s, 60s, you're not creating problems for yourselves. Have you found that there are some sort of rules that, yes, they're going to get you those you know, strength, muscle gains that you're after, but you're also not going to create some serious problems as you get older, like a lot of these bodybuilders have. You know, they're, they're, some are in a mess, you know, backs and... So Ronnie Coleman, and for example, right. Um, so, yeah, good question. So what I would say is you go to failure, but fa your failure is technical failure, you know? We can all... When I do stiff leg deadlifts, you know, I think my record is 405 for 20. I mean, I even got 22 once. I can stiff leg 405 for 20. <laughs> but if I'm super arched, I might be able, only be able to get 405 for 10. But I can round my, my back a little bit, especially my upper back. But I know how much is, you know, I know how much I can get away with where it doesn't hurt the next day. If, but if I'm like, say I just haven't been training them a lot or I'm just, it's not a good day, and I'm, you know, and I'm doing my set, let's say I round too far. Let's say I'm just like, I'm not going to care what my, I'm just going to round as far as possible and just, and then I end up with an injury. Or you just, you, you do put more stress on those structures. So I would say definitely you can go to failure, but make it good technical failure. And like, you know, bench press, it's hard to screw up. It's like, you know, of course people can bounce it and lift their butt up. But like, say you have a normal bench press, it's not hard to, but there's some exercise like deadlifts where you can, you can have some ugly, ugly, like it's where it's just painful to watch. So that's what I would say, like, don't, uh, don't extend the set to where the reps look ugly. Have all the rep, the set ends when you can't pull off a pretty rep. Mm -hmm. And then if you're the type that goes to failure, that really pushes hard, we've all seen them. You know, if you're a trainer, you know, you've got a few types of people who just push so hard. And then you've got some people who don't push it that hard. Well, the people who push it super hard, you don't give them as many sets. And the people who don't push it hard, you give them more sets. That's how they see better results. And so a lot of my strongest girls, their workouts, they're doing 10 to 15 sets a day. That's it. They're not doing 20 sets a day. They're not doing 30 sets a day. You think 10 sets? Really? Yes. I can crush them with 10 sets. They can crush themselves with 10 sets. I, you don't have to always be doing super high volume, especially if you're the type that pushes it hard. And especially if you're the type that never deloads and doesn't periodize your effort and things like that. So but that would be 10 sets per body part? Or, or, per workout. Or, per no, workout. like their workout, they're doing lower body. Right. And it might be three sets of pause, pause full squats, three sets of, you know, bar plus band hip thrusts, two sets of stiff leg deadlifts, one set of dumbbell walking lunges, and a triple drop set on the seated hip abduction machine. That's and if you're thing. strong and you're going for PRs, that's a brutal workout. I would have so many people listening to this that goes, they would think, that's it? Really? I could, I could do so much more than that? And it's these same people that are weak. You know, I have so many people that I need something more advanced. That's a wimpy workout. And I go, oh, you need something more advanced. How many chin-ups can you do? Well, none. Why? You're not advanced. You need to be working on your chin-ups. Three sets of negatives is hard. Three sets of three negatives where you're really fighting. The problem is you go watch them lift and they're going three sets of negatives. They don't sit there and go, until <laughs> they're shaking and and then go all the way to here and you're still, you know what I mean? They don't know how to train hard. <laughs> so you got all this stuff on the internet too because you got these people that don't really train anyone. I'm one of the few trainers that works with bikini competitors that's popular who trains people in real life. So a lot of people out there, you look at these workouts and they're crazy. They're crazy. But a lot of the bikini competitors don't train. You watch their workouts and you're like, they don't train that hard. They just kind of go through the motions. They're not pushing themselves that hard. So sometimes that works out well for them. But if you train, I don't want to say properly, but if you, if you train hard, 
you can't be busting out 30 sets in a workout. It's, 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 I wish people could do these workouts <laughs> themselves and see how daunting, how hard they are, you know? I want to move on to glutes because I know that is just in the sort of final part of the interview because that is really what you're known for. I think, they, what do they call you? The godfather of, of glute training. Is that, yeah. is that one of your titles that you're proud to own? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so explain for me and, and others because it, you know, I, I, I thought you know, that's your glutes, but um, as I've learned more about you, I, there's, there's a little bit more to it. So explain the, the different parts of the glutes and, and how they work for, in, a, you know, in a very simple, simple way. All right. Well, the glutes are the glute maximus, glute medius, and glute minimus, Okay. So glute max down here, glute medius is up higher, and then the glute minimus is underneath the glute med. All right, now, the glute max does kind of five things, I guess you would say. Um, it does hip extension, but also does posterior pelvic tilt. They're similar. Posterior pelvic tilt is kind of like hip hyperextension, but it's, it's turning the pelvis upon the femur, not the femur upon the pelvis. Now, it also does hip external rotation, and then it also does hip abduction. Now, the upper fibers tend to work a little bit in the frontal plane with the glute medius, but in the transverse or horizontal plane, the lower fibers are more involved. And so you basically would never just want to do one movement for the glute max. And then the, the glute medius, the, their role differs with it. And there's also three. So there's a, there's a, for the glute max, there's a lower and upper subdivision. For the glute medius, there's a, a, an anterior... A, a, a middle or a you know medial or sorry uh, and then the the posterior heads for the glute medius I've heard there's two versus three it depends that's not as, as studied but bottom line you have to do multiple exercises to work the muscles you don't just do one you do a variety so you know if you look at my rule of thirds where a 30 exercise should be vertical hip extension exercise like squats and lunges one third should be horizontal hip extension exercises like hip thrusts and back extensions and kickbacks. And then one third should be lateral or rotational like lateral band walks, seated hip abductions, and you know, um, band standing abductions, things like that. Then you tend to develop all the muscles, all the heads, every, all, but not just for the glute maximus, but for also for the glute medius and minimus. They all get maximally developed that way. One of the, a friend of mine, Pete, I think you know, he was, he sort of, we were talking before this, and, and he sort of said, why, why do you think that the medius being so important for pelvic and pelvic stability and gait is, you know, doesn't get as much love from the training community? It's this, um, well, it's so important for function, but it's, it's not talked about in bodybuilding. I mean, th I think it's, I, I can't explain it. I'd, I'd love to hear other people's opinions. I think it's a homophobic thing it started out as because think about back in the day, and it's still this way. You will not, you, it's so weird because I know bodybuilders. I'm friends with some of the top people, like not friends, but like colleagues with them. And what's your workout? Well, I do, <laughs> I do chest and tries on Monday, then I'll do legs on Tuesday, then I'll do back and buys on Wednesday, I'll do shoulders on Thursday and then arms on Friday. Oh, leg day. What, what do you do for leg day? Well, for quads, I do this, and for hams, I do this. And they never mention glutes. They will mention traps. <laughs> They'll mention all three cool. heads of the delt. They'll mention the biceps, the triceps. Sometimes they mention the forearms. You know, they'll mention the pecs, the upper pecs, the lower pecs. They'll mention the abs. They'll mention the lats. They'll mention the, 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 the upper back or mid back. They'll mention the erectors. They'll mention... The, the hamstrings, they'll mention the quads, they'll mention the calves, but some muscles you never hear of, the tibialis anterior, <laughs> you know, you don't hear about the, 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 the QL, <laughs> the multifidus, um, you don't hear, uh, uh, certain muscles you never hear about, but the biggest, mu the, the glutes are the biggest muscle in the body. You don't hear about the glute medius or the glute max very often, and lately, but you, it's weird. In men's bodybuilding magazines, you never hear about it. But women's magazines, it's all about the glutes. And I, I feel like I've helped change that a lot. I've, I helped create this whole niche. Before me, people did squats and lunges, some RDLs. 
Even girls would say, I like that seated hip abduction machine. Men would go, no, that's stupid. I like kickbacks. No, that's stupid. Just squat. And I came along and I invented the barbell hip thrust and I, all, not just the hip thrust, all the different barbell glute bridges, hip thrust variations, single leg hip thrusts. But I also said, it's okay to do kickbacks. Do your kickbacks. Do your back extensions in a glute dominant manner. You know, round your upper back, turn your feet out. Do all this abduction movements. Do them with bands, do them with machines. And it changed the way people train their glutes. If you look back to the 70s, at how Arnold trained his pecs and his delts and his back and his quads, and then you look at how the guys today train, sure, there are some ni nicer machines now, but it's pretty much the same. You know, what did, what did they do for legs? Well, squats and leg press and leg hack extensions. squats and, and leg extensions and for, for hamstrings, some stiff leg deads, and then leg the three curls. different types of leg curls. And what do they do now? The exact same thing. The exact same thing, you know? <laughs> Except maybe some of them like this new pendulum squat that's at the gym or something, or some new machine. But now, you look at all the... Arnold trained his pecs. Guess what he did? Well, he did, he did bench press, incline press. He did weighted dips. He did flies. He did crossovers. Guess what they do now? That same exact thing. Nothing's changed that much since the 70s for any muscle group except the glutes. And now the glutes have done a complete 180. They weren't trained at all. No one talked about them. It was just assumed, and I think Vince Gironda had to do with this. And he told people, do not train the glutes. In fact, don't even do squats. Do hack squats and do them frog style to maximize quad and take your glutes out of it because it's unsightly if the glutes are undeveloped. So it was just this weird thing where they never talked about glutes. They still don't. And then... Now you look at how they're trained, and they're trained totally differently. They're trained according to the rule of thirds now, which I came up with. And you see people doing, hitting them from all the angles. And glute development is way better than it used to be. Now, for the males, it's not necessarily their training. They're just on better drug regimens. You know, and they get these shredded glutes. And they can get glute development from all the leg training they do. But not so much women. The bikini competitors... They're doing so differently. They're doing their hip thrusts. They're using their bands. They're doing all the different exercises. They, they love all the different glute exercises. And you look at how glute development has changed in, the, in bikini. If you look at, I think the first was 2009, I think. And you look at how, who won in 2009. It's, com it's crazy. Then you look at 2010, 11, 12. And you look at each, if you put a picture of each, you know, you'd be like, whoa. They have changed, the, the glutes have changed dramatically over time. It's completely different now. And I, I think that um, that's very telling because it coincides exactly with how the training started shifting. What, what do you think the glutes are harder to build than, than others? Is, you know, is some of it down to, I, I speak to women about this and you know, it's obviously they all want that kind of nice shape, but is, is it a lot of it genetics or can you make a kind of real measurable difference and I have seen a lot of your pictures on it but can you do it just by training in the right way following some of your philosophy? I don't think they're harder I think it's like every other muscle like what what muscle came easy for you <laughs> do you have one like for well, me actually pets. my glutes you know well, your glutes well, <laughs> they're, just, they're always as a kid they were yeah. just always there were like and made I... fun of for having glutes <laughs> yeah. as a kid mine was my pecs I always had those lines I don't have to work hard I can just do close grip bench and still have pecs. <laughs> I don't even have to do wide grip. I don't have to do crossovers. I will always have pecs. And then I'm lucky to have some calves. Some guys cannot get calves to save their life. And think about what muscle is hard for you to develop. You know, for me, my, my delts, I've always wanted to have bigger delts. And same with my glutes. You know, I have, my friend Paul has bigger glutes than me and he never even trains them. <laughs> His first time hip dressing, he hit 405 for reps. I'm like, cool, it took me two years to get to 405, you know? And it's just genetics. 60% of this is genetics. And so some of these women have such great glute genetics, and it's sad because they're almost the worst people to listen to. They are the worst people to listen to because they don't know how to get, how, they don't know how to get glutes. They, all they have to do is lean, they could do cardio and lean out and have nice glutes. And that's the, and that's, that. <laughs> There was this woman, Jen Selter. Yeah, she was the queen of the Belfie. Yeah. She, she was so popular. She, she made the Belfie popular back in the day, like the butt selfie, you know? 
And I remember she had like... Belfie, I didn't know it's thir- called that. Yeah, 13 million <laughs> followers right off the bat. I think she stayed put. I don't think she cares. But anyway, um, uh, she had this uh, amazing physique. It's, it, it, and it, it was what people were so intrigued. How does she have such a big butt and these small legs? It's funny because in the bodybuilding world, people are like, well, I want that glute ham tie-in, which, by the way, the glute ham tie-in back in the day was you don't want any protuberance between the glutes and the hams. You want it to be this smooth, and I'm going, I don't want, that was more for figure and stuff. You don't want it, you want the hamstring so big that there's no crease. And uh, I, I started telling people, no, you do want that. You want the glutes, as, you want to see this roundness, and then you kind of want smaller legs to make the glutes look bigger. That's, that's what got popular. Look at the girls on social media that got so popular, you know. Some of these women just with nice glutes have you know, 10, 20 million followers just for having nice glutes. <laughs> and it's genetic. It doesn't mean they train them intelligently. So it's about 60% genetics. Now, I don't say that to, that's with everything. That's with guys too, with your, you know. Mm. Some guys just have huge pecs and they don't have to train them hard. But there's still a lot to it. There's still a lot you can do. But, you know, I, I've heard all these theories about, you know, gluteal amnesia and all these things. And what is gluteal amnesia? I was going to ask you about that. I mean, is it's that... a made-up thing that, that doesn't really exist. I said it back in the day. I, I, I love to use this NASM terminology that's outdated. It's like, look, because, I mean, if I say this to you and I'm trying to get you as a client, I'm like, listen, you have gluteal amnesia. Like, listen, you're sitting right now. You sit half the day. While you're sitting, you are shortening your hip flexors. Look, your hip flexors, your hips are bent. You're shortening your hip flexors. You're getting adaptive shortening at your hips. And this is going to interfere with your glutes because not only are your hip flexors tight now, you now have reciprocal inhibition of your glutes. They're now shut off. And now you have to rely on your hamstrings and your adductors to extend the hips for your weak glutes, and now you're getting synergistic dominance. And now you're going to have hamstring injuries and adductor injuries and problems all up and down the chain because your glutes are dead and they don't activate. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I've also heard it called dead butt syndrome. And it's silly. Like, the glutes still activate. They just are deconditioned. Mm -hmm. You know, if you walk around... If you felt your quads and just stood up from this sitting position, they get rock hard. If you walk up a flight of stairs, your calves get worked. But in everyday life, our glutes don't activate that highly. They're not, you know, in everyday life, you're not, you go take stairs, you take one step at a time. You don't take three steps at a time and work your glutes. You're not sprinting, you're not jumping, you're not squatting deep, you're not hip thrusting anything. When you pick something up, you just stiff leg it. You don't bend down, grab it, chest up, knees out, squat it up. So everyday life doesn't activate the glutes that highly. And so it's deconditioned, you need to strengthen it, you know, and just get stronger at these basic movements. Right. And what about the, um, one of the things I was looking at is the knees, is another thing I was chatting to Peter about, but the knees over toes guy that, that is very focused at this sort of quad focused training. And, um, you know, I suppose what, what you're talking about is almost like this sort of glute, glutes without the quads and keeping the quads slim. And I guess, you know, for, for him, it's very much quad focused and not sitting back and, and um, you know, engaging the glutes in the same way do, you know what are your thoughts do you know anything about what you know his training methodology what are, what are your thoughts yeah on that? so first of all does anyone know his real name I, I don't know. <laughs> he's the knees over toes guy <laughs> i'm the glute guy he's the knees over toes guy but um people at least know my name i don't know this guy's name but he's great um so first of all i'm a uh, i'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist i love it all i i did make a, a an ebook how to grow the glutes without growing your legs, because women want that. But I tell them in the book, most of you, the vast majority of you should be training your legs. When all my clients, I'm, I have them training their legs, but a lot of women, they think I'm quad, you hear that from everyone, I'm quad dominant, I'm quad dominant. And that's because, you know, they have some leg development, they, but a lot of it's just 
If you get heavy, you have big legs. A lot of it's fat. So they think, oh, I have big legs. I, my, I'm quad dominant. No, you need to lose weight and get down to your ideal weight that you like. And then you'll, you'll see that, you know, you actually don't have a lot of muscle there. You need to strengthen that. You should strengthen everywhere. But anyway, so I, I love quads. I love hamstrings. I love everything. I love every, I've studied everything. I've studied grip training. I know every, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say, I know everything. <laughs> yeah, but everything. <laughs> I have studied everything. I've been in this field. I started studying hard when I was 15. I've been studying for 30 years and lifting for 30 years, training people for, for 20, uh, 25 years. So I love quads. This knees over toes guy has, I haven't tried it. I need to try it. But he's done an amazing job, similar to what I did for glutes. Everyone was like, oh, just squat. And when I came out, I got so much hate. Everyone's like, look at this idiot trying to, what's this stupid hip thrust exercise? It looks vulgar. It's, uh, you know, just squat. No, do this exercise. And, and, and he comes onto the scene in a similar way. And everyone's like, oh, what an idiot. Everyone knows knees over your toes are dangerous. And he's saying no. And, and he, he walks the walk. He had, um, he had, severe knee pain and he said I have the I had the worst knee pain out of anyone I've ever known and I get knee pain so I'm very interested in this and I've looked into his model and he does a lot of backwards sled dragging mm -hmm. he does a lot of split squats where you progressively get to where you can go fur further and further your knees over your toes and do these split squats and he does these like sissy squats and reverse reverse Nordics where you're going back getting a huge quad stretch and he, he even recommends strengthening the tibialis and the hip flexors, the whole anterior chain. He's the first guy, you know, it's funny, as I've said some of these things in some of my writings back in the day, but never a comprehensive train this whole front chain and strengthen the tendon. You know, there's, there's always been a little nebulous whether you can, like it makes sense. There's Wolf's Law of Bone, where bone gets stronger, a bone adapts according to the lines of stress you place upon it. And then there's, uh, there's, so there's Wolf's Law of Bone and then Davis's Law of Soft Tissue. Soft tissue strengthens according to the lines of stress placed upon it. But we don't have a lot of evidence, in, in, but a new paper just got published and it looked at identical twins. And one twin was sedentary, the other twin was involved in some sport that had an aerial phase, meaning it wasn't just walking. It was something where you jump or sprint. And I think it was like the one twin had, the, the active twin, they looked at um, Achilles tendon stiffness, had about 22 or 28% stiffer tendons, meaning there were stronger, stronger tendons uh, and, you know, better for, you know. So that's important research because it shows that activity and strength training are good for strengthening the tendons and stuff like that. Well, people get, there's a lot of different reasons people get knee pain, but patellofemoral pain is rampant. And if you've ever had it, it's this kneecap pain. And it's sometimes it's, you know, the quadriceps tendon, sometimes the patella tendon, sometimes the kneecap, it just hurts. I used to get it as a kid and a lot. pain yeah. shuts down muscle activation. And it also decreases your neat. Meaning, if I go, uh, you know, if I, if I'm sitting on the couch and I know my knees hurt, I don't want to stand up off that couch. These youngsters can't imagine that. But I, I'm around here, people are always over at my house. And I'm like, hey, Alex, can you grab me a, a, a diet soda? Or, uh, you know, can, can, hey, will you, will you grab me a yogurt and a, and a big spoon or whatever, you know what I mean? Grab me um, a, 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 a peanut butter bar or whatever. Like, I... I am a perfect bar. I, I'm obsessed with them. But I, like, I'm always asking for snacks and drinks. And I'll, someone comes up to talk to me, and I'm like, "Okay, cool." And then I go, "Hey, t can you toss that in the in the in the trash?" Like, <laughs> hand him an empty can or an empty Gatorade. I don't want to move. That decreases my need. Remember when you were younger? You just you were springy and all spry. You'd get up, run around, you'd do everything. Over time, our need reduces. When I say need, I'm talking about non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Right. So. Pain decreases muscle activity, meaning it's, a, it's, an adaptive, it's an adaptive thing like a, 
why, if, if my knees hurt, why would I be able to jump as high as possible? I'm, it's a sparing effect. Mm -hmm. You're trying to spare those joints. It's probably an evolutionary thing. You're smart for doing that. Yeah. You know, it's trying to protect something some of the time. Sometimes pain is irrational, but sometimes it's, it's smart to do so. So, you know, if you can theoretically strengthen the, the, the connective tissue, the, the tendons, all the different soft tissue, and, well, he did it to himself. He got out of pain. And, and I, I should mention, my pain scientist friends would always want me to mention, like, there's so much more to pain than just biomechanics and, and posture and structure and all that. There's a psychological component to it, a sociological. There's a lot. Pain is very complex. Strength coaches tend to make it just about biomechanics. But anyway, this guy in my opinion, is doing a great thing for the world. He's telling people, no, because you hear these people, you, you do a squat and people go, oh my God, your knees went over your toes. You still hear that all the time. Well, Olympic lifting, they have, if you squat deep, your knees have to go over your toes. If somehow you kept vertical shins, when you were going down and then you went deep, you'd just fall backwards. Or you'd just have to like round your back so bad, then now you're gonna probably hurt your low back. And so, this guy is doing a great thing. I'm, uh, I've never met him. Um, and I, I want to do more of his stuff. It's just so hard to like, when you have a routine to start implementing. People probably do that with my glute stuff. They're like, I have my workout. How do I get started? And I'm like, don't just jump into one of my programs. Just start doing hip thrusts on your leg day. Just start doing hip thrusts, you know? See if it helps. And then once you start seeing some results, then you'll be like, I think I'm going to hip thrust twice a week. I think I'm going to split up quads and hams and have a quad and glute day and a ham and glute day. You know, or if you're all set, dive into one of my programs. But you, you, if you're a man and you need bigger glutes, because a lot of men want glutes too, and they should. It's like becoming more popular now. For it men is, yeah. Work. Well, now you see the rise of the machines. I went in, uh, into a gym in Fort Lauderdale the other day. And it was so cool. It was a, a, a powerhouse, Fort Lauderdale. So I go in, and right away I look to the right. They have the, the, the squat, um, the power racks, but with the platforms out in front. And there's two people doing hip thrusts off regular benches. Then I look at the Smith machine, and people are doing hip thrusts off the Smith machine. Then I go to the back, and they have my BC strength hip thruster. And someone, there's two girls doing hip thrusts off that. And it's funny. I wanted to be like, hey. I, and that's my that's my equipment. I want to go to the people. I always want to be like, hey, I invented that. They wouldn't believe me now. They're like, what? <laughs> it's always funny. But then right smack in the middle of the gym, there's three hip thrust machines. They've got the hammer strength, the Nautilus glute drive, and the, the arsenal strength hip thrusters. So there's literally six ways to hip thrust, and they're all being used. Are those your, do, you, do you get royalties on all those? Or? I get royalties for some of them. Some of them I could, I could, go, I could go after them. It's just draining. There's yeah. so many of them now. It's hard to give them a... Everybody's after you. A letter. <laughs> well, I also am glad to see these pop up. Yeah. I don't want to limit the number. I want machines everywhere. But yeah, I invented... You have to be careful about it. saying that, though. And if, <laughs> and like, oh, I was listening to this podcast and Brett said he wants glute machines everywhere. <laughs> I, I, want them in, I want them to be as popular as the lat pull-down machine. Every gym should have a lat pull-down machine. Every gym should have a good hip thrusting machine because it's hard, you know, to do them on a bench. I don't want to set up a bench and put the bench against something stable and load up plates, and it's just a pain in the butt. Mm. And the plate, if, especially if you're big like me and you use normal plates, how do I get over my thighs? i got to put them on. It's a pain in the butt. That's why my hip thrust platform is so nice. But when you do them off the Smith machine, it's loaded up. You, it's elevated for you. You start from the top down. Same with a lot of these machines. It's really nice. It makes for a lot more comfortable hip thrusting. So a couple of questions before we wrap up, because uh, it's great, and I've had, I have loads of questions, but we, I'm, I'm conscious of time. But in terms of glute machines, then, like you've got a number of inventions, but is there anything that you've not, that you, that, that you feel has not been invented yet in order to train the glutes in a way that you feel could be without giving away your secrets of things that you're developing but is there anything that's not out there yet that probably should be outside of the glute thrust machines it's more like okay there's some abduction machines right now that are really neat the gluteator is one of them but then this techno gym has a standing hip abductor um but then there's some old school um hip abduction machines where you can change from being seated forward you can change the angle and this works different, you know, you can work your glute meters more if you're leaned back more. I would like to see 
more comfortable. It's kind of like the machines are out there, but we need ones that are more comfortable for the majority of users, more adjustable or some sort of different configuration to where, like even with hip thrusting, does it work on this five foot tall woman? Does it work for some six foot six male? Um, you got to care about those things um, because like the Nautilus glute drive, I love the Nautilus glute drive. I love it, but a lot of my clients don't because <laughs> it's, it's, they're short and it doesn't feel good for them. You know, my clients, a lot of them love the booty builder. I used to love the booty builder. I don't like it as much now, but they seem to love it but not everyone does. And a lot of it's like, how do we get this? Once you get strong, we need better padding because it's hurting, hurting people's hips once you get strong. It doesn't matter when you're using a plate or two plates, but when you get up to 500 pound, when you're a woman who weighs 130, who can hip thrust, you know, 550, 600. I have girls who can hip thrust 600 pounds. I have like five, there's might be five to seven of my squad members who can hip thrust over 600 now and they get bruises, it, it gets painful. Some of them have to stop. Uh, one, one client got, got, had to get the, her scar tissue surgically removed from there. Yeah, so we need better padding and um, just uh, more, I have some ideas, I just don't know how to make it happen. More ways to work all the actions of the glutes. It's just hard to do because of size differences and anatomy differences, like I said. Five foot tall to six foot six. It's really hard to do that. Yeah. So before before I finish my last questions, then do you want to tell people about like you got some programs that that you have going on at the moment? So if people want to learn more about you or, or get involved in some of your whoops, some of your trainings, where where can people go to find out about that? Well, I mean, you can always just Google Brett Contreras if you forget my name, Glute Guy. But my Instagram has been you know, where my link, my link tree on the Instagram, that's, that's been where most of my, you know, li that has links to everything. I have a lot of different things. My, my booty by bread is my most popular program. That's my monthly program. And I pour a lot of energy into that. That's like a, that's a month to month program, but it's, I'm always trying to make it exciting and effective. And I have a really unique way of periodizing that, that I'm very proud of. I have my BC Strength products, and I think we have the best glute, glute training products on the market. Um, I just did a strong lifting certification, but I, I plan on doing more over time. But the strong lifting is my strength sport that I created. It's like powerlifting, but with six lifts instead of three. You got your squats, bench, and deadlifts, but you also have your military press, chin-ups, and hip thrusts. And I think that's the best way to train for physique in the off season. You know, you should train that way and build those lifts up. And then, you know, just I'm trying to grow this educational platform of BC, BC uh, Academy, Brett Contreras Academy. I'm trying to increase more products for BC Strength. Always trying to make Booty by Brett better. And my, my workers um, right now have three moderators, but they're always trying to think of ways to make it better because they're in the trenches on the Facebook um, page, the private Facebook page, just always trying to make it better. So, um, and then there's my book, Glute Lab, but my, my partner with that, Glenn Cordoza, he wrote Glute Lab with me, and we're always, um, we, we, we came up with strong, the Strong Lifting Cert. We're working on a glute training ebook right now that answers all your questions. That should be out in like a month. But yeah, I'm always coming up with new things and trying to innovate and, and, and stay the glute expert, the world's glute expert. I'm always studying, I'm always reading, I'm always um, trying to think of new solutions and new equipment that will raise the, 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 raise the bar, so to speak, with, uh, with glute training. So, I, I, and I hope people appreciate that. I, I love getting good feedback about all my, my products and services. So my final question then, like, has there been anything that you've, been very passionate about and believed in terms of glute training that over time as you've evolved and learned new things that you've sort of changed your mind on whether that's a piece of equipment or, or a training methodology at all and how important is it to sort of also not remain too fixed about one particular idea well I can tell you, you know, like in strength training 
things that we learned along the way. Like we used to tell, I, I was, I was, uh, I remember I had a sheet in 2006 at my first gym lifts. I would give this paper to people and it was like my, my philosophy. And it was like, you want big arms? Do squats and deadlifts because squats and deadlifts jack up your, your testosterone and growth hormone and IGF-1 and this travels through your bloodstream and the androgen receptors and all the different receptors from all over the body soak it in and you grow everywhere. And I really believed that at the time. And that was all pseudoscience. Squats and deadlifts are great at growing the muscles involved in the squat and deadlift. They don't grow the biceps though, you know? Um, so that, like, there's an instance where we were wrong, but uh, with glute training, I have so many things I'm curious about. I'm cur I have a whole list. It just sucks in our field because things, ideally, if you, all right, let's look at the hip thrust. I wish there were 100 studies on the hip thrust. I wish there were 100 training studies on the hip thrust, meaning we put this group through this program, we put this population through this program with these variations, and then we looked at MRI and we looked at how their glutes responded. And not just glutes, strength, performance, everything. And then this study had a different population, and this study used a different amount of volume and frequency, and this study looked at different variations, and we could have a nice review paper, I would write the review paper and I'd say, here's what we know, you know? But training studies are hard, they're rare. You know, you do a, you do a 16 week training study, then if you're a professor, you had to start on week one training them. You can't, you, you can't do 16 week, you have to do like 12 week usually, and you have all these dropouts and it's really time consuming and most don't have the, how many have access, professors and institutions have access to an MRI? So then you could say, okay, you're not, you don't use MRI, use something else, but ultrasound is kind of hard with glutes. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> um, and you know, other, uh, you can't just take a, a tape measure and look at glute girth because you could gain fat. And so um, it's hard. Training studies are very hard to come by. Our field will never have tons of training studies. In an ideal world, we'd have so many training studies on every single exercise and every exercise variation that we'd be able to make conclusive recommendations. But we don't have that, and we never will in our in our, in our in our field. Is that why even you a think thousand so years much, from now we won't? Is it, do you think that's why there's so much? Sort that's why the wild wild west. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So because there because there won't be like that. I say there won't be in a thousand years, but in a thousand years we'll just have like pills or injections to take that make us have the body we want, you know? <laughs> or we'll just have goggles and we'll be a kind of like a, a An jelly. avatar of ourselves, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, in the meantime, because of that, it's the wild, wild west out there. So then we use clues. It's all pieces of the puzzle. We might have one or two hypertrophy studies or training studies, but then we have kind of like the, the most... The evidence that we talk about most is, is kind of like subjective, but hey, you know, it's like when I do, when I do um, cable kickbacks, I really feel it here. When I turn my foot out, I feel it more here. You know, and like if I do abductions and I turn my foot and I feel more upper, I feel more lower, I feel this more. I like it when I squeeze the top and it's all anecdotal. It's based on feel. And then you can palpate up. Yeah, that gets rock hard. You know, not just for glutes, for anything. Oh, my, my bicep, oh, that's hard as a rock. Oh, this isn't really working your biceps that much. You know, and then it's like, okay, so there's feel, there's tension. And you can see tension if you wear leggings. You can see how the glute's contracting, you know. And that's, then there's the pump, the burn. This burns like crazy. Oh, my God, this gave me a huge pump. So, and then, oh, I did a bunch of sets and I was sore the next day. I got doms right in here. You know, those are your first line of evidence. They're very subjective, but those, if those things all tend to be there and you talk to other lifters and they experience similar things and other coaches are like, hey, and trainers are like, when I started doing hip thrust, my client's glutes grew a lot. That's good evidence. You know, sometimes we, like, we didn't have any studies showing that squats grew your glutes a few years back, none. But we can look at Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters and say, they tend to have pretty nice glutes, you know? Bodybuilders tend to have bigger glutes than regular people. 
probably these exercises were good for the glutes. Now, the next line of evidence is acute mechanistic research. So it's like, those are things that can provide numerical data, you know, and these are things like EMG. There's a lot of things like EMG, like functional MRI, and, and it can give you, quanti you know, it can quantify the data. Things with ultrasound and um, like thickness, did it give you a pump? How much pump? <laughs> How much cell swelling? Or, you know, was there muscle damage? How much muscle damage? And then there's physiological things too. Well, this had muscle damage. We can measure it through thickness, swelling, but you can also measure it through creatine kinase or myoglobulin. This gave you a good pump right after the workout. We can also look at lactate or some other metabolites. And these are kind of like clues. And, you know, there are some studies that use a lot of these things. And, some study, some, and so some, sometimes there's not that valuable data because, cool, you did squats and it elevated your lactate, but what muscle was worked? That worked a lot of muscles. You got a lot of creatine kinase. Yeah, it damaged your muscles, but which muscle did it damage? So then you could look at a biopsy and look at Z-line smearing to see the muscle damage it got. Um, but these are clues. Any logical person, any person with a brain, any person who has any scientific, um, you know, like um, proclivity, I don't even know if that's the right word, um, who has any, like, is good at science, would look at what I just said and say that makes a lot of sense. We should use all the pieces of this puzzle. But here's what the gurus do. They say, ah, feel is so subjective, that means nothing. What you feel doesn't mean anything. Sensation is nothing. Why do they do that? Because then they can say, they can justify, and then they say research is all biased, you know? And EMG doesn't mean anything. Really, it doesn't mean anything. EMG is my favorite. I know it's limitations, but tell me what doesn't have limitations. Which one of those things can I tell you that doesn't have limitations, you know? So, a good scientific individual would use this exercise effectiveness chart <laughs> that I just listed and say they're all pieces of the puzzle. Mm. Some rank higher than others, but this is how we... And then you look at also the biomechanics. You look at the fiber directions of the muscle. Does this make sense that this muscle would work? You look at... And then you can look at more advanced, the numerical things. Let's look at the moment arms. Let's look at, you know, things like that and say, would it make sense for this muscle be, to be highly involved in this movement. And then you can take it a step further and look at musculoskeletal modeling, you know, and, and that's more advanced biomechanics, but you can use all these things. Any decent, good practitioner or, or scientist would use all the things to their advantage to make their decision about an exercise, but you would also train a lot of people. You'd train yourself. There's people talking about glutes who don't train their <laughs> glutes. And you can tell because they say the dumbest things. Like they say that the hip thrust is a bottom range movement because you're flinging your hips up and it doesn't work the lockout. Any which way you slice the hip thrust, it works the lockout. If you, if you don't feel it in the lockout, you're not, you're not doing a hip thrust. Because from day one, when I taught it to the world, I said, control the weight through the full range of motion. You know, pauses have been around forever. We've always worked the lockout. So they're making up their own things. And that's not just with the hip thrust. You see it with the squat, the deadlift, bench press. There's wars about... But it's the wild, wild west out there. I have no problem with someone says, hey, well, it's just the exercise bashing that I hate. I hate it. I love every exercise. I would never bash in a movement. When I remember first seeing single leg RDLs, I was like, that doesn't, why would just do two legs? Why would you do one leg? I even tried it once and I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm so off balance. Then one day I was with my kettlebell, my 106 pound kettlebell, and I'm like, I held on to the counter. And I started doing them, and I was like, oh my God, I love single leg RDLs, you know? And ex injuries, if you really lift weights, injuries have a way of making you like a lot of different movements. Because yeah. I can't do this, but I can do this. And then training other people, training old people, training young people, training, you know, women, training men, training um, tall people, training short people, training beginners, training advanced, training someone with some injury, an issue, you tend to love every exercise and you say, this is when you should do it. You don't say leg extensions are stupid, just do this. You say leg extensions are good for warm-ups. They're good for bodybuilders. They're good for the, they're good for the rectus femoris. They're better than squats 
for the rec fem, and they're valuable for a lot of reasons. You never say this is stupid. You say, I like, I like this for these reasons, but if this is your goal, I like this a little yeah, more. Yeah. But it's this black and white, it needs to go, but unfortunately that's what tends to get rewarded on social media <laughs> these days because it creates drama and it pe yeah. keeps people glued to their phones. We need to get to a point where that's not rewarded because they're not, they're not right, they're not accurate, they're not talking, they're being black and white, they're not painting out the gray area, and they're often very wrong because good scientists don't paint things that way. No. It's, I guess it's like everything, like if you want to get into good shape, if you want to learn training methods, there's no shortcut, there's no easy way. It sound, you know, certainly from your experience, it comes from a huge amount of trial and error and experimenting on yourself, on others, over time, keeping a broad mind on many different things and not necessarily discounting any because it could be relevant in a particular area that you've not even considered. <laughs> so it's, oh, uh, and then to come back to your way of thought, what did you think was good that, that now you don't think is good anymore? Things I question. Could you just do a bunch of hip thrusts and maximally grow, grow your glutes? Do I need to really do the rule of thirds? Do I, need, do I need vertical hip extension exercises? Like, I feel lunges in my lower glutes so much, but muscle damage isn't that important for muscle growth. Could I not do lunges? Do I not need to do super high reps? Because I hate high reps. I like it for the pump and the burn. Do I, is metabolic stress overrated? Do I not need to do it? Could I just do s several types of hip thrusts like lots of sets of them, but in the, you know, six to 12 rep range and maximally grow my glutes. I don't know the answer to that. So I take the shotgun approach. I, t I, do, I do it all until I know more. Right now I have a shotgun over time. I wish I had a laser and I could laser in, but we don't know enough right now. Do, do the glute burnouts help? At the end of the workout, I love to give my clients these three minute glute burn. They burn like crazy. Do those help or could they hinder your glute growth because they just provide excessive fatigue? You know, I have all these questions, especially with things in the research. Like there's some studies showing wearing blood flow restriction bands on the thigh helps grow your glutes. But I think that's for distal muscles, but they could fatigue the quads and make you use your glutes more. I don't believe the studies, but I don't, I'm not like a hater. I just, I, I like to do my own research. And then, like I said, with Brad and I, we did our own research and they're like, okay, he's right. Well, I don't trust all the studies because I don't always think they have good form or know what they're doing. But anyway, um, muscle, electric muscle stimulation. Should we be going to sleep with electrodes on our glutes shocking us? Does that help? Or is it worthless? Stretching. Should, does stretching help at all with hypertrophy in, in between sets, stuff like that? Does it help a little bit or nothing at all? Cardio. Cardio for the glutes. I think it's... My consensus right now is that it can't help with weight training. You shouldn't do cardio to try and feel your glutes. In fact, it can hinder your growth. You should train your glutes hard and then do the cardio you do should just be for burning calories. You know, walk, cycle, do something low impact that doesn't interfere with your weight training. But anyway, I have all these things that I wonder. And, you know, maybe we'll do one of these. Well, I'm glad we've got people like you that ask those questions and try and prove it. I, I think that's a good thing. And I, I guess that comes full circle from where we started, where there's, a, there's this misinformation and people peddling different ideas and criticizing things. And I think, you know, as, a, as consumers or trainers and professionals, you, you've got to kind of, you've got to stay open-minded and try and find people like you that are spending the time and obsessing about these things and can be bothered to do a lot of the stuff that most people can't. So... Look, I appreciate your time, Brett. We could go on for hours. I know we could. <laughs> <laughs> you can go on for hours. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll be back again in Vegas yep. at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review. Leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.